Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association Quick Trip Wisconsin Counties Association Wisconsin Realtors Association and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139 State Representative Lisa Subek of Madison is a Democrat. She is now representing the 78th Assembly District. She's seeking a fourth term, but she has a primary challenger. The primary is August 11th. Representative Subek, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you so much for having me. Well, when I interview incumbents, here's my first question. Incumbents know how the Capitol works. So if you're reelected, your top priority in the next session. Sure. Well, thank you for asking. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, we know that on everybody's minds right now are two big issues. And one is COVID-19 right. and the other is um, racial and racial justice and the injustices that we've seen. So clearly, when I think about top priorities in the immediate sense, those are among the most immediate priorities. Um, you know, I think ultimately, though, we need a fair system that works for everyone. And so when I think about how those priorities tie into the bigger picture, it means working on a wealth of issues, working on issues like health care and access to education and ensuring that, um, you know, many of the reasons that I first ran for office were because I was working in social services and I saw that not everybody had the same opportunities I did. Not everybody um, could navigate the system. There were unbelievable barriers in the way for some people and not for others. And we need a fair and just system that works for everyone. And I think at its core, no matter what issue I'm working on at any time, that is, um, that is the lens through which I look at it. We need to strive for equity and we need to strive for opportunity. Well, let's come back to those two issues that you mentioned. Do we need statewide standards for uh, how police treat those in custody? Do we need to ban chokeholds? Do we need to ban no-knock warrants? Do we need to keep a database of officers who most often resort to violence with those in custody? Um, those are part of the, what the governor wants a special session on, but it doesn't look like he's going to get to session. But do we need statewide standards? Yes, yeah, Steve. I, you know, I watched the video of George Floyd's murder, and it was a murder. And I don't think anybody who watched that could watch that video and think that what happened was okay. That is not a practice that should happen. That should be banned statewide and frankly, nationwide as well. Um, we do need some statewide standards. The governor is now leading the charge, but in the legislature, we have proposed bills, um, led in particular by my colleague, Chris Taylor, but Democrats have proposed bills. I have co-authored and co-sponsored a number of them to try to set forth some basic standards to keep our community safe for everybody. And that does mean setting some uniform standards for law enforcement. I think that we can bring people together to the table and say, what do we expect? How do we keep our community safe? And what do we expect from our law enforcement partners in doing so? The, um, when we talk about COVID, how much of a response is the state and how much of a response is the federal, Lisa? <laughs> Sure. So, you know, I think the federal government has failed epically on COVID um, when we look at from the begin from the start, how it, how it was handled, how it's been portrayed by our president. When we look at access to personal protective equipment, when we look to resources that were and were not available to our communities and our states, um, the federal government has failed. And that is shameful. And we need change at the federal level. Um, that said, the state also has a responsibility. And I think we started out with some really good, strong leadership on this issue. The governor um, looked to our health officials, looked to the Department of Health Services and our public health officials, because any decisions that we make on COVID should be rooted in science and rooted in the best medical guidance that we can achieve. And that's what we saw from our governor. He put some orders in place, laid out a plan for how we evaluate where we are on COVID-19, how the d disease is progressing, how well we're doing or not doing at various points in fighting the disease and preventing it. And that should be the guide for how we move forward and reopen the state. 
Unfortunately, the Supreme Court stepped in and took away his authority and made us one of only a few states across the country without a statewide order in place at that point. Many of our local communities have stepped up and put their own orders in place to try to keep this under control. But I think that um, ultimately, the responsibility rests with the state. This should not be a political issue. We're talking about preventing a communicable, preventing a communicable and in many cases deadly disease. And yet somehow it has become a political football and that's shameful. Um, health and welfare of our population should be one of our top priorities and it should be about doing what is best, not about politics. Um, the pandemic, of course, has hit the economy and healthcare providers the state relies on. Uh, recessions cause less revenues for the state and more demands on safety nets like Medicaid. Should the legislature in the next budget make hospitals an even greater priority, Lisa? Sure. You know, first off, I want to say thank you to the frontline providers at our hospitals, at our clinics, and throughout the community who have been on the front lines fighting this pandemic. Um, their courage, their bravery, and the risks that they are taking for the rest of us um, are unparalleled. And so I want to say thank you to anybody who's on the front lines for your hard work in doing that. We absolutely need to support our hospitals. These are critical providers in our community and they are suffering and struggling as a result of this pandemic. It changed what hospitals were able to do. People had to put, not what are elected surgeries, but what were non-emergency surgeries or non-emergency other healthcare services on hold mm -hmm. um, in order to minimize exposure to COVID-19. And clearly that has an impact on the bottom line for our hospitals. There is one thing that we could do right now that would make a huge difference in this, and that's to accept federal Medicaid expansion dollars. Republicans in the state have stood in the way of taking funds to expand Medicaid. If we want to help our healthcare community, that's what we need to do. In the last budget, the governor proposed expansion. Democrats supported it. Republicans pulled it out of the budget. But that would have brought another $1.6 billion dollars in healthcare, in healthcare money into the state. It would have provided insurance for an additional 82,000 people. And on top of that, we increased spending by 324 million at the state level. And those were all funds that would have been covered by that federal money. So if we wanna step in and help our hospitals, the very first step is that we should go ahead and figure out how to expand Medicaid. Except, let, let's have a bipartisan moment here in which we put people first. Let's accept that federal money. Let's stop putting politics ahead of lives. And then, and then we'd have the resources we need to invest in our hospitals and our healthcare system. Should businesses that follow the uh, prescribed COVID-19 practices, uh, uh, WEDIC or CDC, should they, be uh, should they be immune from frivolous lawsuits? Um, you know, it's certainly folks who are acting in good faith should be protected from frivolous lawsuits. I mean, frivolous lawsuits are a problem. That said, we have courts to determine what is frivolous and what isn't, you know? And it is critical. Unfortunately, so often when we talk about frivolous lawsuits, um, the laws that get changed actually end up protecting people who knowingly do harm. I mean, for years, industries like the cigarette industry and tobacco industry were protected. Um, Republicans put in place a law, um, gosh, just before I was elected to the legislature, so not too many years back, that, produ that protected producers of um, products with asbestos from, um, from lawsuits, you know, and the reality is those who are negligent and those who intentionally cause harm need to be held accountable. Um, the people suffer if they're not held accountable and those who are harmed should be able to be compensated for that harm. Oftentimes you can't make up um, for lives lost or health loss, but when people incur great, you know, large amounts of healthcare costs or other damages, they should be able to, um, they should be able to be compensated for that fairly. And that is what our court system is for. Governor Evers has warned that general fund tax collections because of pandemic related uh, issues may drop by $2 billion in the next fiscal year that starts July 1 on Wednesday. If, if we saw that $2 billion drop off in GPR tax collections, your choices 
cut program, cut spending on uh, these critical programs or raise revenues, which might mean tax, raise taxes or fees. What, what, where are you on those options? Sure. So you're asking the $2 billion question here, right? This is what's on everyone's mind right now. And there aren't any quick and easy solutions. I mean, I think I mentioned one piece a few minutes ago, which is we should expand Medicaid and accept the federal dollars. That's not going to solve the problem, but it will make a dent in it. Um, you know, as I said, in this budget, we added 320 or we added $324 million in new spending on healthcare that would have been covered had the Republicans not refused to expand Medicaid. So that's one piece of the solution. We also have to remember that budgets are about priorities and should reflect our values. So we should think about what are the most critical services. Um, if we do need to make cuts, and I believe that we likely will, um, we need to really think about our priorities and make those cuts accordingly. I also think that if we start talking about where can we find new revenues, those new revenues can come in part from closing some of the loopholes that exist in our tax system. Um, I, along with some of my colleagues, have put forth proposals that would close tax loopholes that allow very big businesses not to pay their fair share into our state's services. They use our services, they profit off our services, and they don't pay their fair share of taxes because special interests have been allowed to rule the roost for far too long. I guess the one other thing I would look to is criminal justice reform. Um, criminal justice reform is not only a moral issue, it is also a financial issue. And we are one of only, I believe it's five states now in the entire nation that have not found a path forward to some sort of bipartisan criminal justice reform. Our prison budget is growing. It grew by 5% in the last budget. Um, it is a huge amount of money that we spend on that system. Um, we have put forth a proposal led by um, Evan Goyke, who's on the criminal justice committee. Um, we have put forth a proposal that would really look at our criminal justice system, would look at how we reform it, would put reporting measures in place to make sure that we are doing that responsibly, and then would take some of that money and reinvest it into the kind of preventative programs that keep people from reoffending and that over time begin to shrink um, shrink the system and shrink that budget. And, you know, it is a financial issue. And that is why we've been able to find bipartisan agreement in so many other states. Um, I think we can do that here, too. Um, perhaps our budget shortfalls will be the reason. I think there are more reasons to reform our criminal justice system than money. Um, it is also about how we treat people. It is about um, Wisconsin having some of the worst racial disparities in the nation, in our criminal justice system, but it also is a financial issue, and this is the opportunity to save us some dollars while doing the right thing. Just to clarify, a different subject, you support the governor's call for a People's Commission to, 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 to draft the next set of congressional Senate and Assembly maps, correct? Yes, yes. I actually have long been a sponsor of a um, nonpartisan redistricting reform bill that would put a system into place similar to what they have in Iowa, where a nonpartisan group, in this case our Legislative Reference Bureau, would be put in charge of drawing the maps. It makes good sense. I mean, you know, people should be able to choose who, who represents them and not the, not the other way around. And okay. as it stands now, politicians in the state choose what voters they want. The majority party has used that for far too long to consolidate their own power. In the last um, in the last election, Democrats in the assembly took, I think it was 53 or 55 percent of the vote statewide, um, yet only achieved 36 of the 99 seats. That wasn't to the will of the people. It's time we start honoring the will of the people. And are you a sponsor of the bills that would legalize uh, both medicinal and recreational marijuana? I have sponsored bills to legalize both, yes. Um, okay. The bills have changed a little bit over various sessions, but yes, indeed I have. I think that it is, you know, the governor proposed legalizing medical marijuana in his budget. And I think, again, when we talk about filling budget holes, marijuana may be a piece of that. Um, I don't think it's the incentive or the reason we should do it, but certainly that's a piece. Um, 
But I also think a good place to start is medical marijuana. But if you look around the country, um, the ship has sailed. Um, and there is a lot that we can learn from other states and how they've gone about legalization of both, both medical and recreational marijuana, and we should do it. Um, I would like to see the federal government follow suit as well, because clearly a federal framework would be even better. The, the uh, two questions on property taxes, Lisa, the caps, the limits that school districts and local governments live with um, to control property taxes. Um, uh, if elected, if reelected, would, would you vote to keep those property tax uh, caps and limits in place? Sure. So um, I, I think that something that is crystal clear, if you look across the state at the referendums that have happened to fund our schools over the last several years, voters are again and again voting to raise their own property taxes. So obviously those caps aren't working. Um, the bigger problem is that the way our property tax system is set up is fundamentally unfair it doesn't favor the ordinary person who, is, who owns a home or who rents and is trying to, um, trying to achieve the American dream for themselves, who's trying to get ahead. Um, the system benefits the big corporations, again. Um, so there are a couple of thoughts I have on property taxes. One is schools are clearly the biggest piece of our property tax bill. We need to change how we fund our public schools. State level funding for our schools has been shrinking year after year after year. This year, thanks to the leadership of the governor and the fact that he set a high bar with his proposed budget, we were able to increase that, but we did not increase it enough. Um, we have a long way to go. We need to get back to where more of our schools are funded at the state level, not through local property taxes. We also need to close, I talked about loopholes in our state income taxes. We need to close a giant loophole in our state property, in our um, property tax system that affects our local governments. And that's what's called the dark store loophole. Big box stores are able to come into a community, open a bustling, profitable, well-trafficked store, and then based on a court decision and a loophole in our law, get that store evaluated as if it were an empty, abandoned, dilapidated property with nothing going on, it, with no profit being made, um, basically a blight on the community. And as a result, um, those corporations have not had to pay their fair share of our local property taxes. That means more and more of the burden to fund our schools, to fund our fire departments, to fund the municipal and county services that we count on is falling on the average resident, the average homeowner, and falling on small business owners who, can't, who don't benefit from that same loophole. Um, a bill's been proposed. I'm a co-sponsor of it to close that loophole. Here's the really interesting thing about this bill, and this is an example of where um, the partisan divide has really gotten in the way of doing things well. This bill has broad bipartisan co-sponsorship. In fact, a majority of the members of the legislature have co-sponsored it. Yet, Republican leadership will not even let it have a hearing or come to a vote of the Assembly and the Senate. And that's shameful. Um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's incomprehensible. And the reason it happens is because the Republican leader, um, in this case, Speaker Robin Voss, but also in the Senate, um, Scott Fitzgerald, are so beholden to the special, mo special interest money that comes into them through organizations like Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce that they hold bills like this that benefit people hostage again and again Politics are being put ahead of people, and that's what I'm working so hard to change. Let's work together, find common ground, and put people first. Well, just a quick follow-up on property taxes. With counties and municipalities relying on the property tax for 40% to pay for 40% of their services, do we need to look at some of these now-exempt items from the sales tax? Do we need to broaden the sales tax as a potential alternative to property tax? Just quickly, just a quick follow-up. Yeah, as you know, Steve, I served in local government before getting elected to state government. I served on the city council here in Madison, and I felt firsthand the challenges that our city faced. Um, you know, state revenue is shrinking not only to our schools, but also to municipal government. In a city of a city like Madison, where we have a lot of state property, <clears throat> pardon me, in our city, 
those payments to municipal services are shrinking. So I think first and foremost, we have to look at how the state helps fund municipal services, and that should be the first place we look. But okay. the state has also tied cities' hands on trying to find new revenue sources, preempted our cities and counties' abilities to do so, and we should stop standing in the way of our local elected officials doing what they were elected to do, and instead, let them be accountable to the people and determine what revenue sources work best for their communities. Okay, two final questions. The first of them, a study found that in 2015, out-of-state contractors were awarded $72 million in public works projects by local governments, and that number doubled to $146 million in 2018. The question, should bidding standards and requirements give preference to Wisconsin companies when local governments authorize public works projects? Absolutely. And actually, I was the lead author um, over the last couple of sessions of a Buy Wisconsin bill that would start moving us in this direction of giving a preference to um, giving a preference to in-state contractors when we purchase goods and services. I think we absolutely should prioritize in, in-state labor. We need to support our working people right here in Wisconsin. Um, Republicans have made that harder with some of the anti-union laws that they've passed. Um, and they've made that harder by rolling back Wisconsin's prevailing wage law, which ensured that government contracts paid a living wage on which um, folks could support a family and afford to live in our communities. Um, the race to the bottom has really um, been what opened the doors to so many of these out-of-state contractors who are coming in and scooping up contracts that should be given to, lo to, to local entities and local companies and should be paying local workers to do that work. This is our taxpayer money paying for these projects. Let's keep it right here in our state. Okay, we're almost out of time, but one quick question. You wanna highlight differences between you and your primary opponent on August 11? Sure, um, our state is facing immense challenges going forward. Some of the biggest budgetary challenges that we've seen in generations. We are facing challenges in light of recent events um, that have really brought to light the racial injustice that we see and the systemic racism and flaws in our system. Um, we are also facing immense challenges as we move forward with the broken healthcare system in the face of COVID-19. And right now we need an experienced leader who has spent her entire career working on these issues. I've dedicated my career to working to better the lives of children and families and working people in our community. And that is what we need in the legislature. That is why I am hopeful that um, when you go to the polls or better yet, when you request your absentee ballot and mail it in so that you stay safe and healthy, um, that I will have your vote in the upcoming August 11th primary. Thank you. Thank you. State Representative Lisa Subek is a Democrat from Madison, serving the 70, uh, 78th Assembly District. She's up for re-election, and the primary is August 11th. Lisa, thanks so much for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you. Thank you. Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139.